Καλησπέρα, καλησπέρα. Good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Maria Kaliambu and I'm senior lecturer at the Hellenic Studies Program at Yale University. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our conference entitled The Greek Revolution and the Greek Diaspora in North America. As you know, this year marks the bicentennial anniversary of the Greek Revolution. The conference aims to document how North American Greek communities perceive and enliven this milestone of the modern Greek history. The conference will offer both historical and contemporary critical reflections about the expectations diasporic Greeks foster about their history. It will also discuss the significance of the revolution in the identity formation of those communities and the mechanisms by which they cultivate the memory of the revolution. At this moment, I would like to invite to our virtual podium the Minister Councillor Theodor Bizakis, Deputy Chief of Mission of the Embassy of Greece in Washington. Mr. Bizakis, it is our honor to have you with us. Please take the screen. Kalimera, good morning, everybody, being here in Washington, D.C. Um, <clears throat> I'm very um, glad to be here with you today in this uh, very, very interesting and fascinating conference uh, from Washington, D.C., from uh, the offices of the embassy here. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, Professor, um, uh, we celebrate this year the proclamation of the Greek Revolution uh, in 1821, and uh, which um, represented the nine-year struggle that made it possible for all Greeks to be free and sovereign citizens and um, the establishment of the Greek modern um, state. Uh, thus far, it has been a really spectacular year, both in Greece and around the world, but I should say, especially here in the United States, we have seen many, many uh, very interesting and, and interesting uh, events uh, happening all around, the, all around the United States in many, many cities. We saw a lot of blue and white lightning on 25th of March, and we were very, uh, very pleased to see that. Although due to the pandemic, as you know, a lot of events took place virtually, but still the spirit of commemoration and celebration is very, very, um, um, is very, very live here in, in, in USA. Uh, uh, you know that um, the Greek Revolution, a lot has been said, and many, many um, uh, scientists and uh, historians uh, have um, have developed the issue of uh, how the Greek Revolution was, among others, inspired by the American Revolution, and how overall the philhellenism, the, the movement of philhellenism all around the world, but especially here in the United States, uh, helped a lot uh, to to begin this struggle and to end up successfully uh, with um, uh, the Greece becoming a free and, and modern state. Um, you also, it's very well known that we speak. And usually here, you know, in the diplomatic and political worlds, that we are nowadays, especially today that we are speaking, we are um, witnessing um, the a peak in our bilateral relations between Greece and the United States. We, we call it usually also an historic high of our bilateral relations, which is true. Um, 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 this is true, and we recently have this week <clears throat> the visit of the, of the foreign minister here in Washington D.C. The signing of an agreement, and overall, uh, the political, the bilateral relations of the two countries um, are, are an excellent stage. But uh, I need to say that besides uh, government, besides politics, it's always uh, behind all these things are always people, and these people mainly are the Greek diaspora, the Greeks who live for many, many decades here in the was in in. Uh, in the United States. And they, um, having lived for many years here, here having um, worked very hard, they really, really represent or reflect a, a mirror of Greece here in the United States. And this is not just that we're saying the Greeks, it's um, uh, the Americans who say that. And even very recently, Biden, uh, President Biden um, explicitly said that in the, 25th, in the 25th March celebration, uh, an individual event. So I mean that um, you know uh, the, the image of Greece here in uh, in the United States. Um, we owe this uh, this image a lot to a lot to the to the Greeks who live over here. And um, <clears throat> we've said a lot about uh, the the influence of the of the of the with the influence of the American Revolution here um, uh, for the Greek Revolution. But uh, it would be really, really very interesting and, as I mentioned before, fascinating 
to listen today to all the um, scientists and researchers about how the Greek, the Greek diaspora um, uh, has lived uh, and has uh, commemorated uh, the 25th March, the revolution and our uh, commemoration day here uh, in the United States, because this has been reflected also to the Americans, and this is what, what matters. Uh, so uh, it is a very interesting and very genuine, I would say, idea for this conference, and we're very pleased to be part of this and to listen to what you, uh, your uh, distinguished guest will have to say. And uh, we thank the Hellenic Studies Program for all the work doing in the Yale University uh, and all those who support the workforce, you know, financially, because research and education need support. And this is very, very important, as we all know. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure, but both an honor for us, for the embassy to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much for your good words, Mr. Ambassador. And this is very good to know that our conference coincides with a good timing of the Greek and American relations. So let's try to see now the historical and cultural uh, involvement of those as we will discuss about this today in our conference. Uh, at this uh, moment, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the sponsors who supported this conference. First, the Modern Greek Studies Association Innovative Initiative Grant. Second, the Edward and Dorothy Clark Kemp Memorial Fund and the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Third, the European Studies Council at Yale University. And last but not least, the Hellenic Studies Program at Yale. The activities of the Hellenic Studies Program are generously funded by the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies at Yale University. Some logistics before we get started. The presenters will speak for about 15 minutes each, and the conversation will take place at the end of each panel. Please use the Q&A function to type your questions, and we will do our best to respond to as many questions as possible. The conference will be recorded and uploaded to the Hellenic Studies Program's YouTube channel. I will very briefly introduce each presenter. However, you can find the full bios of the presenters and their abstracts at the website of the conference. So without further ado, let's get started. The first panel examines closely the perception of the revolution to specific Greek communities and associations in North America. Our first speaker is Alexander Kitroev, professor of history at Haverford College. Alexander's research focuses on ethnicity in modern Greece and the diaspora from politics to sports. He has published six books and Kitraev's current projects include a book commemorating the 100 year history of AHEPA, the American Hellenic Educational Progressive Association and a book on Greek owned diners in America. His talk today is on AHEPA's commemorations of 1821. Alexander, welcome. Thank you for coming and the screen is yours. You are muted, Alexander. Let me, you are muted. Let me unmute first. Thank you, Maria, for uh, organizing this uh, uh, conference. I think it's more like a workshop uh, with all these uh, distinguished colleagues and friends that I'm very glad to be joining. Uh, let me uh, share my, uh, my screen. And you should be seeing my um, PowerPoint presentation. Yes. And my topic, uh, as Maria said, is the AHEPA's commemorations of 1821 as a Introductory uh, comment, let me say that uh, I, I'm currently here in Athens uh, teaching a course on American Philhellenism at the college here in Athens. And uh, we are visiting museums which, uh, which uh, are focused on 1821, exhibits at museums focused on 1821 and, uh, and the uh, Philhellenism. Uh, um, the National Library in their, uh, the refurbished National Library reminds us of one of the two main paradigms through which 1821 is represented. I read from their page, in the newly formed Greek state, art was intended to serve a pivotal political, ideological, and above all educational role to preserve the memory of the heroes through the struggle and sacrifice 
achieved the independence. This is one of the main paradigms through which 1821 is remembered and uh, represented. There is another paradigm that we saw very clearly when we visited the Philhel a small, uh, new Philhellenic Museum in the suburb of Nea Philothei. This is an actual photograph of two of my students and the director of the museum. And as you can see from this painting and the others on the other two sides, and the paintings which exist in the rest of the museum show us the second paradigm, which is the 1821 represented through the sacrifice of the civilians, a strategy deliberately aimed at eliciting the support and the sympathy of uh, Europeans and Americans, uh, sympathy and support to the suffering Greeks. So that's the second paradigm through which the uh, 1821 revolution is usually remembered and represented. Um, before talking to Ahepa, uh, talking about Ahepa, uh, and I see I have a typo here on the left, uh, just quickly, um, memory, I've been teaching a course at Haverford on the, on the, the way wars are remembered. And uh, the top quote here that you could read, I don't have to read it for you, just reminds us that memory is group centric. In other words, um, there are as many memories are as they are groups. And I very much suspect those of us looking at groups such as Greek American organizations are going to be finding out that, that each of those uh, organization, organizations has their own way of remembering. 1821, and Ahepa, I will be arguing, has a particular way in which it has commemorated um, 1821. Um, and of course, aside from being particular, memory is also uh, when it when it is when its aim is to commemorate. It obviously is celebratory. There's been a discussion. Um, during the 200th anniversary celebrations in Athens, to what extent we talk about the civil wars, which were a huge element in a, the, uh, a, the course of the revolution in the 1820s. Well, obviously uh, one doesn't expect too much dwelling on civil wars during uh, celebratory commemorations. So we just kind of that, a footnote, a just reminder, we're looking at, we're looking at the bright side. And now to look at Ahepa, I'm actually showing you a slide of the Ethnikos Kyrix. Uh, this is one of the earliest references to American Philhellenism that I could find in the Ethnikos Kyrix archives, which are available on the web. And it appears in 1930. 1930, of course, is the year that Greece celebrates its independence because during, uh, in 19... 21, when it was exactly 100 years since the revolution, Greece was fighting, uh, there was the campaign in Asia Minor going on, Greece was at war with Turkey, it wasn't a moment for that, those type of commemorations. So the celebrations took place in 1930, and this is when the Greek press, more or less, is the first time that it mentions the role of American Philhellenists, Philhellenists and their role in the revolution. Ahepa, however, does it much, much earlier. Um, th there was in 1928, the erection of a statue of Ypsilantis in the, um, the town of Ypsilanti in Michigan to honor both Dimitrios Ypsilanti and the Philhellenes who established and chose the cho established the town and chose the name Ypsilantis to honor one of the heroes of the Greek Revolution. Even before that, even before 1928, 1927, at the Fifth Supreme Convention of Ahepa in Miami, the order um, allocates one thousand um, dollars for research work. To I'm quoting research work to compile uh, historical information relating to the aid given by American citizens to Greece in her 1821 
struggle for independence. And again, in 1927, there's an Ahepa chapter in Wichita, Kansas, that celebrates the Greek Revolution of uh, 1821 by focusing on the Philhellenes. Um, throughout the 1930s, which is the time when, of course, all the uh, independent celebration are taking place, AHEPA is distinguished. It's the only organization that um, adopts a series, engages a, in a series of celebrations, um, mostly laying wreaths at monuments or graves or statues of important Philhellenes. This is Jonathan Peckham Miller one of the best known American uh, Philhellenes who went to Greece, fought on the side of the Greeks. He is the person who brings back a one of the orphans who becomes Miltiadis Miller, the first Greek American deputy for Wisconsin in uh, the um, later part of the 19th century. And uh, uh, Jonathan Peckham Miller is also an important abolitionist. And Ahepa uh, honors him through a special meeting of the Vermont chapter that, um, that honors the memory of, uh, of Jonathan Pecker, um, uh, Jonathan M Pecker Miller. Daniel Webster, of course, is the deputy, the uh, he's, he's a congressman. At the time, he was a congressman of both New Hampshire and, and Massachusetts. He is the person who stands up in the Congress and delivers two fiery speeches, one in December of 1823 and the other in January of 1824, calling upon America to recognize Greece and send military aid to Greece. Um, something that, and he, he's got tremendous support in Congress, but of course, because of the uh, Monroe Doctrine, as we know, the president uh, eventually prevails and America does not send military aid to Greece, nor does it offer diplomatic uh, recognition to the insurgents. Uh, but of course, that triggers the Philhellenic movement among civilians. So Ahepa uh, lays, lays a wreath um, at the foot of the Daniel Webster um, uh, statue, which is uh, at the uh, State House in uh, Concord, uh, uh, Con uh, Concord, New Hampshire, I believe. Uh, another, uh, another example of this series of commemorative wreath layings or statues or honoring in some way, the Sons of Pericles, which is the uh, men's youth organization of Ahepa, establishes a monument to the American Philhellenes in Mesolongi. And this is, uh, this, is, this is interesting because uh, there are a number of uh, memorials to European Philhellenes in Mesolongi at the time. There are none uh, honoring the Americans, so the Sons of Pericles and Ahepa, of course, take it upon them to take the initiative and establish a monument that honors the, um, the American Philhellenes. And of course, um, we, he, we now uh, are in a stage in which we can actually see the instrumentalization of these type of commemorations. I read the bottom of this uh, text. This is the text from, from uh, Lieber's official history of AHEPA that came out to commemorate the 50th anniversary of AHEPA in 1972, a very, very detailed history by Lieber, which is available on the web in several forms. U.S. Senator Sherman Minton of Indiana and U.S. Representative Emmett O'Neill of Kentucky co-sponsor co a joint revolution and talk about the uh, significance of erecting the monument uh, in Mesolongi, but they go beyond the, the need to commemorate 1821 and describe this act as a part of its program of further cementing and binding the goodwill that exists between the two countries, America and Greece. Moving on to the end of the uh, interwar period, which is the first 
part, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm looking at three periods. I'm looking at the interwar, I'm looking at the 150th anniversary, and I'm looking at the current bicentennial. So to conclude the interwar period, uh, this is the dedication of a monument to Samuel Gridley Howe. Samuel Gridley Howe, of course, the uh, Massachusetts physician, uh, who is probably the best known American philhellene. And AHEPA uh, uh, um, presents a memorial uh, dedicated to Samuel Gridley Howe to uh, Brown University. The monument is still on the campus. Uh, earlier this year, the, uh, the Greek General Council of Boston um, had uh, visited that, uh, that monument and their photographs of that. So here's another example um, of Ahepa's um, commemoration and honoring the Philhellenes. Um, the theme on uh, the theme of the commemorations in the late 1920s and 1930s, exclusive focus on the Philhellenes who were mobilized, the American Philhellenes who were mobilized to support the suffering uh, uh, civilians, the population of Greece during 1821. Uh, at the same time, commemorations are taking place in the American press, in other organizations. They are focusing more on the heroic elements, the Kareiskaikis, Kolokotronis, those heroes of the revolution. Ahepa barely mentions them, is entirely focused on the Philhellenes, because of course Ahepa is, is um, going through a period of its history in which it's stressing its Americanism and the connections be between Hellenism and, uh, uh, excuse me for that, Hellen Hellenism and America, and is um, therefore going to support the um, um, focus on Philhellenism and not the heroes. I'm now moving on very quickly to the 150th anniversary, but I am making a stop before I get to the 150th anniversary to talk about the Colonel's coup d'etat of 1967 and Ahepa's reaction. Um, the uh, Ahepa's early reaction to the Colonel's coup d'etat is not uh, one of the best moments in Ahepa's history. Uh, Ahepa claims that it doesn't get involved in politics and to the extent that the Greek, Greece and the United States are still continuing their diplomatic relations, it, 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 seem, it, it, it endorses the um, continuation of Greek-American relations during the junta. The interesting thing is that it does it by invoking the Philhellenes, the statement that HEPA comes up with in 1967 that talks about a long history of alliances, which is continuing after 1967, begins by invoking the Philhellenes, Samuel Gridley Howe and, um, and George Jarvis. During the 150th anniversary of 1971, um, inevitably, Inevitably, Ahepa's commemorations get entangled with its um, attitude, its, 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 uh, it, the attitude it has adopted towards the Greek junta. It strikes a medallion commemorating the 150th anniversary of, the, the, of Greek independence, which you can see on your screens. Um, I apologize, the images are not very clear, but these are, the interesting thing is these are not um, dictatorship images. They, they are uh, a HEPA and Philhellenic images um, commemorating the 150th anniversary. Um, however, this medallion is presented both to Richard Nixon and dictator uh, Papadopoulos. In uh, 1971, the AHEPA magazine comes up with a special issue dedicated to the 150th anniversary. And interestingly enough, 
there are no junta images, barely a mention of the junta. And there's a, the, the, this is the cover of the magazine. You can see Samuel Gridley and Howe on the top and, and Lord Byron on the bottom. So an, an ambivalent attitude by a HEPA, it's returned back to its stress on Philhellenes um, as it had uh, in the 1930s. Most important uh, moment in the 150th commemoration by HEPA is the issuance of a 52-page uh, history of the Greek War of Independence authored by, uh, by George Lieber, who is the author of the history of a, a HEPA. This is also available on, on the web. It is in, in actual fact, a very good, a quite, I, I don't want to say excellent summary of the Greek revolution and the role of the uh, American Philhellenes. Uh, again, uh, Lieber just get, goes straight into the revolution. There is no introduction. There is no connection between the current situation in Greece or anything like that. It's just this, this is what happened at, in the revolution. And, uh, and here are Americans' contributions to the Greek cause in the 1820s. A, a, a very uh, decent and interesting uh, effort by, uh, by George Lieber. Um, I move on now to the final, the, my third focus, which I will uh, summarize because it's not, it's barely history. It's, it's the events that happened this year. Here, maybe uh, Ahepa's attitude to the bicentennial was much more straightforward than it was to the 150th anniversary. Uh, Ahepa in 2019 at its Supreme Convention in Chicago had adopted the um, uh, slogan, Defend Hellenism. Uh, it is an era of transnationalism, as you know, where, uh, an, era, an era in which Greece is paying special attention to its diaspora, and Ahepa is responding, and it returns back to the practices of the 1930s, which is to visit various monuments and uh, uh, lay wreaths and publicize the role of those particular Philhellenes, um, the, the photo on the left, the HEPA commemorates Philhellene John Allen is from the uh, English version, English edition of Kathimerini. It's in, this is in Baltimore. John Allen was, uh, uh, was from Baltimore. He went to Greece and fought on the side of the Greeks. And on the right uh, from Cosmos Philly to um, uh, news items on a HEPA celebrating the Greek bicentennial at Fort Mifflin in Philadelphia. And the slide on the bottom right is Samuel Gridley Howe's grave in um, um, Massachusetts. And uh, it's uh, HEPA begins its uh, bicentennial celebrations this year by going to Gridley Howe's monument and laying a wreath. Finally, and most important, my last slide almost speaks for himself. It speaks for itself. AHEPA, it becomes the only major Greek American organization to actually hold its convention. Uh, obviously, it was scheduled for this year, but it makes the decision to hold it in Athens. Uh, it wasn't an easy decision because of COVID, and not everyone, I think, was um, happy, and there was, uh, there was some uh, issues to be dealt with, but AHEPA came to Athens in July uh, and the Greek state responded. They were received by uh, President Sekelaropoulou. They had uh, Prime Minister Mitsotakis and Prime Minister of Anastasiadis of Cyprus at a separate event. Then they had another event in which they had Mayor of Athens, uh, Bakoyanis. And in many ways, uh, this event of actually uh, going through difficult logistics and holding the event in Athens to honor the bicentennial of the revolution and several events associated, associated with the convention were, were connected with the bicentennial, um, I, I think is, is an example of, uh, of the way AHEPA is, AHEPA's 
commemorations of 1821, the trajectory of these those uh, commemoration commemorations show us the evolution of a HEPA. Uh, Americanization in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, involvement in politics in a, in, a, in a kind of conservative mindset uh, in the Nixon era, and now an organization which is very much playing a role of a transnational diaspora um, responding to the open invitation of Greece and taking the initiative to celebrate uh, the bicentennial in Athens, in contrast to most other Greek American organizations, which as far as I know, um, may have honored the bicentennial, but none of them actually held events in Athens. That's my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander. This was really an, a very good elaborating talk and a great introduction to our conference. So you helped us understand the involvement of AHEPA, the biggest Greek American association, so parallel with the Greek American identity throughout the 20th century, as this is manifested through the commemorations of the revolution. Thank you so much. I move fast to our next speaker, Nick Alexiou. Let's move on. So now we're going to focus on one particular city, the city of New York. Our next speaker, Nick Alexiou, is professor of sociology at Queens College, CUNY. His fields of interest are social and political sociology and ethnic studies. He has established the first community and oral history archive for the Greeks of New York, and he's the director of the Hellenic American Project at Queens College. Nick, he will speak on commemorating the revolution in New York, a historical overview. Nick, thanks for coming and thank you. And the screen is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maria, and for organizing all this and all um, um, the people who help on that. I'm very happy to be among uh, such a uh, distinguished uh, you know, group of uh, panelists. Uh, good to see all the friends again, uh, even virtually. And of course, I want to thank uh, our audience for making an effort and join us to today. Um, uh, do you see, I I'm not sure if you can see my-, my uh, Not yet, not, not yet. yet. Not yet, not yet. Okay. Let's see. Um, share the yeah, screen. We share it and we have it. Yes, it should be there. Uh, it is shared, though. Um, I, I don't see, do you? I don't think, no. Not yet. Um, Have you hit the share button? Yes, yes, the share button is here, share screen, and... Try again, let's do it again. Yes, okay. You can do it. Yes. Um, Yes, right. Um, because I can see it. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Um, maybe, uh, maybe here I can help us on that. Here I can. Um, here I can share. Yes. Um, Okay. Very good, here we are. All right, uh, yes, we're here uh, talking about New York, uh, in, uh, which, which is uh, the largest one. Yeah, uh, let's move on here, uh, yes. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, let's see uh, what's going on with uh, the States, uh, New York and, and Greece as far as concerned parades. And of course, uh, the States, uh, more or less, is uh, a country, a place, a society that enjoys having parades. It goes uh, well back in, in history. One of the first parades in the States, um, what was recorded was uh, in New York City, uh, the St. Patrick's Day Parade on March 18, 1762. And you can see that it is uh, 14 years before 
um, the signing of the United States Declaration of Independence. So uh, according to various uh, uh, archives, the oldest 4th of July celebration in the States originated uh, in, in Bristol, Rhode Island in 1785. So you see that um, this is a society that really uh, is very, uh, um, I mean, parades are very popular and uh, uh, very much going back to, to history. In the next slide, uh, we're gonna see, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, yeah. Uh, also, we have uh, military parades uh, in, in the States, and there is a, uh, a large number of them from uh, Veterans Day, um, specific days, the, the Forces Day, the Armed Forces Day, uh, Memorial Day, uh, Flag Day, etc. cetera. Uh, Labor Day came later, and it was a massive event on uh, September of uh, 1882. Uh, in the next slide, <coughs> uh, we see that uh, uh, in New York, each year, hundreds of parades are, are held. Uh, it's uh, almost 300 parades. So um, various ethnic and, and racial uh, uh, groups uh, have their chance to uh, commemorate something or um, uh, participate in a celebratory event such as a, in, in a parade. Uh, in New York City is one of um, several cities outside of Greece where Greek Independence Day is formally celebrated. Uh, the first public observation of Greek Independence Day in New York City was uh, in April 6, 1893, sponsored by uh, the Greek uh, uh, society Brotherhood of Athena. Uh, at that time, Mayor Thomas uh, Francis Gilroy received a letter from um, Solon Vlastos, who was the president of Athena, uh, requesting uh, the um, observance uh, and noting uh, uh, the aid that citizens of New York had given uh, for the Greek cause during the Greek War of Independence. So you see again uh, the Philhellenic uh, um, um, aspect uh, that it is uh, present uh, there. Uh, on that day, 300 participant, participants uh, uh, marched on Broadway uh, by way of Chamber Street to um, City Hall, and the Greek flag was flown over uh, City Hall. Um, moving on, we'll see <coughs> in, the next, in the next slide that uh, overall, historically, the role of parades in the States uh, is to establish political power accept mainstream traditions and maintain historical and cultural heritage. In short, it is a proclamation of identity. As demographics and identity change over time, parades evolve and reflect uh, those changes. Uh, now, uh, how does the Greek Independence uh, Day Parade uh, uh, fulfill these uh, roles? First of all, we need to realize uh, that there is a continued presence. Uh, New York City, uh, the, the, the parade in New York City uh, started in 1893, uh, and since 1951, the parade runs along uh, the famous Fifth Avenue in Manhattan uh, from uh, 64 to 79 uh, Street, which is close to the uh, Constant General, um, and, and it become an annual event. Uh, the New York City Parade is the largest Greek Independence Day parade outside of Greece, and this is not uh, uh, very surprising, um, considering that uh, the States and New York in particular um, is home to one of the largest uh, ethnically uh, Greek uh, populations outside of Greece or uh, Cyprus. Um, in our next uh, slide, uh, we'll see that uh, um, who organizes that? Uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, was various uh, independent uh, uh, organizations that did that locally, but since 1938, uh, which is the establishment of uh, the Federation of the, of the Hellenic Society, they are responsible for organizing uh, the parade, uh, 1938. And um, currently consists of three battalions plus uh, an honorary battalion, uh, which, is, uh, um, which marches first. Uh, the Federation, of course, as you know, is a non-for-profit organization, and um, they claim that they have about uh, 200 cultural associations uh, as members, uh, civil associations, uh, regional, and uh, professional organizations. 
So we see the integration um, with the church and the state also. Um, uh, there is a, a doxology service uh, uh, before the parade uh, at the cathedral of the Holy Trinity of that day. Uh, and of course, the American flag and the Greek flag are raised uh, at the ceremony in the bowling, in the bowling uh, 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 green before the onset of the Greek parade. So you see uh, all the rituals that um, 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 are uh, before uh, the parade. In our next slide, we're going to see, uh, uh, you know, uh, try to think some of the broader recognition uh, that, that the parade brings uh, uh, in New York for the Greek American community. So, of course, um, uh, there are other events, other celebratory events that include the annual reception at the White House, hosted by the President uh, of the United States. And this is um, an annual event and started uh, under the presidency of um, Roland uh, Reagan in 1987. Uh, of course, uh, one of the highlights for the city, it is uh, the mass of the Empire State Building, the symbol of New York, uh, is in, uh, in the colors of the Greek uh, flag. Um, acceptance and mainstream uh, traditions. Uh, there are dignitaries, uh, and elected officials from uh, the New York State and the New York City, uh, which are you know, a major part uh, for, its, uh, for, for its parade, and uh, specifically for the Greek parade. The American flag is displaced um, as prominently as the Greek flag. So you see the um, uh, Greek-American relations uh, have an, uh, this co connection and continuity. And these are ways of um, showing respect for the host uh, country and accepting mainstream traditions. Uh, the estimated total cost for putting on a parade is between um, 200 to half a million uh, uh, dollars, uh, which is a, a, a general estimate of the money or, or the cost or the budget uh, for uh, the parade each year. Uh, in the next uh, um, slide, uh, we can see that uh, what is the role of Greece? Uh, we understand that the American society, uh, uh, it is a society that uh, uh, enjoys uh, spectacle and enjoys uh, a parade, but also in Greece, uh, the, par uh, the parades also are very, uh, it's a very traditional uh, um, issue. And of course, uh, they, they became systematic and um, um, formalized during uh, the dictatorship uh, for Ioannis Metaxas. Uh, he was the one who um, introduced that in a more uh, official and formal way. Uh, so uh, both uh, countries, the states and Greece, uh, they are related or they are close to uh, organizing parades. In the next slide, we see um, that um, there are various uh, uh, military parades, also not only the students, and you understand uh, the connections, the political undertones about the glorious past, uh, and of course the uh, 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 heroic uh, eras uh, and uh, contributions of the Greek nation. Uh, as we move on, uh, we realize in the next slide, uh, we realize, uh, you know, we talk about how how that functions uh, for the Greek American diaspora, for the Greek American community in New York. Uh, and I think that uh, one of the highlights, of course, it is the, the, the presence uh, of the Evzenes. And of course, we know uh, uh, what the Evzenes are, but those of, of us in the audience who do not know the Evzenes, um, they, they, they are part of the, of the military, of the Greek military, but at, at this time, they are. Um, a ceremonial uh, uh, body. And of course, their marching uh, is very important and the, uh, it brings a lot of, uh, of um, uh, you know, uh, feelings of pride and, and, and honor. Uh, throughout the years, the Evzones have been included uh, uh, into the Greek American parade uh, narrative in various ways. The most obvious way is that they serve as a recog uh, recognizable symbol of Greece and ethnic pride um, to Greeks and non-Greeks alike. Um, as we move on to the next slide, uh, we can see uh, some um, uh, 
images from uh, various uh, years. This is just after the war, uh, the Second World War, and um, which was uh, a pivotal point for the Greek American uh, uh, diaspora since according to historical evidence, um, uh, it is the moment of great acceptance uh, by the American uh, society since uh, because of the role of Greece uh, during to the Second World War. Um, and uh, uh, you see uh, uh, children uh, in the parade uh, in, uh, in Manhattan. Uh, the next image, the next slide, uh, we can see um, 1953, which uh, it is just after um, the civil war in Greece. And it is um, uh, in the uh, years of the Cold War, uh, where we see uh, the Grand Marshal uh, at that time, it is uh, General uh, uh, Van Fleet, who played a role uh, during the civil war in, in Greece. And he, he, he is part of, of the parade. And in the next image, we're going to see, um, if we move on to the next image, the next slide, um, we see also the role of uh, those who do not uh, participate in the parade as, as uh, you know, um, uh, per se, but they are the spectators. Uh, there are groups uh, who are critical to certain issues. Uh, as far as concerned the Greek American community. And this is during the, um, the junta years. And you see the spectators holding up banners against the junta uh, and um, uh, calling for uh, democracy to Greece. So the parade is not only who, who take uh, part in the actual parade, but also uh, the audience, also the, the spectators um, uh, are part of this. And you have uh, uh, this, uh, 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 group of what is the 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 the, the prevailing ideology, the the prevailing uh, message uh, of the parade, and also the critique um, that happens by um, other groups who are um, uh, the the audience, uh, the spectators. Uh, in the next one, in, in the next slide, we see some of the uh, uh, some images, and this is one of my favorite. This charismatic personality. Uh, of, uh, of Tel Savalas, who was the Grand Marshal in 1976. Uh, Greece uh, has moved on uh, uh, in the, uh, the post uh, uh, junta years and a uh, personality uh, but which is recognizable not only to the Greek American community, but also to the American uh, uh, society. And of course, Savalas was an international figure. And you see the little children, uh, participating and uh, being socialized uh, in um, an event, a celebratory event uh, like the, um, uh, the, the independence. Uh, in the next uh, uh, image, uh, it is uh, interesting to see uh, that even now in, uh, in 2021, uh, back from 1953, uh, you see, a, 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 a continuity and the relation of, of the of the American general Van Fleet, uh, who uh, kneeling to uh, kissing the hand of the Archbishop, Archbishop of that time, and next next to him is uh, Spiros Kouras, who you know uh, according to historical evidence he had a very um, active and uh, controversial role during. Uh, the civil war uh, in Greece. And this is an image that it is on sale. <laughs> of course, we don't sponsor it, but you see uh, from the 50s uh, to 2021, um, the, the, the prevailing uh, uh, ideologies uh, that um, are produced. Uh, as we move on uh, to the next slide, uh, let's think of some of the issues that um, uh, might uh, play a role here. Uh, that um, we understand uh, the complexity that all those images convey um, and, and the parade across the socio-political spectrum and uh, more accurately than any other written uh, description uh, can, can, uh, can provide. 
some of the questions that uh, uh, I would like to, uh, you know, ask to have a moment to think about is, first of all, to realize who organizes the parade and um, who gets uh, to participate in the parade, who are the spectators, uh, and, and uh, how are the symbols, uh, what are the symbols, how they function, and uh, what do they represent. Uh, of course, the other um, um, uh, supportive or auxiliary events that take place are of great significance, dinners, uh, meetings in the White House, etc. Uh, and of course, it's always uh, uh, to realize what is not present, what is omitted, and this, this omission um, uh, 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 from the dominant ideology uh, can play uh, a constructive role um, uh, at some point. Uh, and of course, uh, if there is uh, anything interesting uh, and uh, historically documented uh, in Greek American curriculums, it is a total absence. It is a production and reproduction of uh, ethnic myths and uh, celebratory uh, 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 issues so far. So there is a need um, to um, recapture, or to reimagine uh, 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 issues around. Uh, the war of independence. In our next slide, um, uh, we can we can understand uh, the importance or the role and the function of uh, of rituals like like parades uh, with classical sociological theories. And Milton uh, is one of the founders of sociology, and of course, uh, one of the early scientists who who talks about the importance of rituals. And of course, uh, one of the main points I would like to bring here it is uh, that um, um, uh, the rituals, uh, uh, they, they have um, an objective significance and uh, fulfill the same functions um, everywhere. Um, it, is, uh, it is a process of reinforcing uh, solidarity among uh, uh, groups and um, of course to uh, uh, stabilize uh, ideologies. Uh, in our uh, in our next uh, slide, uh, there is um, a critique uh, to uh, to Durkheim and to the prevailing uh, uh, ideologies that uh, not all not all, all holidays uh, can be uh, unified or, or can be uh, um, uh, forces of creating solidarity. It can also be a um, uh, situation where it is. Uh, uh, and, 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 and an antithesis, uh, a counter ideology uh, that, that uh, uh, serves uh, to modify relationships between uh, various uh, social groups. And one of the comments that um, uh, Etzioni makes is that once we abandon uh, the dominant ideology and, of, um, uh, and the assumption of uh, a close positive correlation, um, about the occurrence and the participation in holidays and societal integration. Um, perhaps there is a chance uh, of for a new ground and, and uh, a new uh, understanding of the role of holidays and parades. Um, as we move on, I would like to make a comment um, involving um, certain uh, sociological issues uh, regarding the parade in New York. Uh, because it's such a, a significant uh, issue among the community and not only. Uh, of course, we understand that the parade is a, a, a conspicuous group practice uh, where visibility is of great significance. Uh, the manifest function of the Greek Independence Day parade is to assert collective identity around an anniversary of historical significance <laughs> paired with uh, the Greek Orthodox uh, feast of the um, Annunciation of the Theotokos. So uh, it is a national and religious uh, uh, correlation here. Sociologically speaking, uh, there are at least uh, two points to consider here, among many others, uh, and uh, focus first uh, to the point of the impression and value of the parade uh, for the participants. Uh, and the second point is the impression and value of the parade for the broader society in which it takes place. Uh, and um, uh, if we bring into our discussion Guy Debord uh, and his famous um, society of the spectacle, as we see in the next panel that I will go briefly, um, the spectacle, especially in societies uh, where uh, um, um, 
the market economy is a dom uh, the dominant practice and ideology. Um, uh, it is uh, uh, a whole uh, uh, um, a reversal of, of, of the real. Uh, and, and of course, uh, the spectacle, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, the tip of, of all ideologies. And uh, it is a full, uh, 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 it, it exposes and manifest the essence of all ideological systems. So it is a very serious uh, critique uh, about uh, market economies, um, about uh, uh, regarding uh, the production, the production of symbols um, and uh, values as a spectacle. Uh -huh. In our next slide, and um, it is interesting to understand that parade as a spectacle as defined by social uh, scientists. Uh, it, is, uh, it is socially and politically uh, constructed. It is uh, a carefully organized social product uh, which relies heavily on symbols. And in turn, these symbols reinforce the symbolic ethnic identity of Greek Americans. As a spectacle, uh, it is consumed. And it is, uh, it, uh, it is important, I think, to realize that this consumption uh, feeds into the Greek American narrative uh, and um, uh, reinforces it. However, uh, if this consumption remains passive, uh, it does not include uh, dialogue or um, uh, offers any opportunity uh, for improvement. So the question that requires uh, further research is how can the parade be um, um, enhanced uh, to reflect history objectively and engage in a dynamic way uh, the contemporary Greek Americans who are Americans of ethnic uh, descent. We, we are in a moment of great demographic um, transformation among the Greek di diaspora. Uh, as, a, as a conclusion in our next slide, um, uh, our last uh, thing is that uh, we realize so far that the states in New York in particular have um, parade cultures, that New York City uh, Greek Independence Parade is one of uh, many parades. All groups in New York uh, and America in general, but in New York in particular, have uh, their special day, and it is a uh, um, uh, you know uh, an annual event. It involves organization, it involves serious budgeting, uh, interaction uh, with city, with state, uh, and of, uh, with the community, and of course uh, with Greece. It is. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, because it, it really is, uh, it is treated as a great celebration, um, reinforces ethnic identity, ethnic pride in an ethnically and racially diverse environment and gives Greek Americans and uh, uh, Greece visibility in American society. Uh, it redefines ethnic boundaries and hopefully, the last slide, um, it is, um, hoping uh, that we finally have a serious debate or negotiation between the dominant ideologies and, and practices of uh, you know a celebratory or uh, triumphalist narrative of the community uh, or the nation and the critique by the less visible or marginalized parts of the of the of the community and then there is a chance to imagine new um, approaches right in order to improve it Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nick, for this insightful talk about the history of the largest parade outside of Greece. And as you said, the parade is a spectacle. And your critical study helps us understand yeah, the impressions of the audiences and the participants. Thank you so much. And as far as I know, Yale students uh, do participate uh, to the parade in New York. So they're going to be part of this spectacle as well. Um, let me move to the third speaker of our last of our first uh, panel. Now let's move from New York to Canada. Um, our next speaker is Athanasios Gekas, Associate Professor and Hellenic Heritage Foundation Chair in Modern Greek History at York University. 
Sakis's research is on Greek history of the 19th century, so I'm an expert on the, of the revolution, and on the history of Greeks in Canada. His talk is entitled Perceptions of the Greek Revolution and the Greek Communities of Canada, 1920s till 2021. Saki, thank you for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you, Maria, first of all, for the invitation. Thanks to everyone who is um, watching. Uh, I think uh, Alexander Kitroev's uh, comment earlier that this is more of a workshop uh, than uh, sort of a mainstream uh, conference is, uh, is very true. I already found extremely helpful both the presentations by Alexander Kitroev and uh, Nikos Alexiou. This is a very much a work in progress. I'll be talking mostly about Toronto, but uh, a few things of what I have to say do apply, uh, I believe, for uh, elsewhere in Canada where Greek communities formed from the early 20th century uh, onwards. Uh, the main question I have is uh, less about how have Greeks in Canada uh, commemorated uh, and celebrate and remember uh, the Greek Revolution uh, per se itself, but how did the ways in which Greeks in Canada have commemorated the 1821 revolution or Greek Independence Day, as it is also known uh, here, change over the course of the 20th and the early 21st uh, century? It seems to me that perceptions of Greeks in Canada and of Greece uh, as well changed during the course of the 20th and 21st century, of course, and so have representations and commemoration projected by Greeks in Canada, unless in a few cases that Canada and Canadians were directly involved in events that were associated with Greece and its history during the 20th uh, century. And I will mention a couple of examples uh, that testify to that. The sources to look into this are mostly Canadian uh, newspapers and the photographs in some cases that we have increasingly after the 1950s uh, onwards, uh, articles since 1925 uh, about when Independence Day seems to have been for the first time celebrated or its commemoration recorded for the first time in Toronto and around the same time in uh, Montreal. The second uh, set of sources that is very important is uh, the archives um, of uh, on uh, Greek Canadian history at York uh, University and uh, the library, some of which some of the photographs you will see in the presentation. This is uh, broadly a study that has to do about the context uh, of ethnic commemoration and its importance of Greek uh, identity in this particular case in the Canadian context, but obviously it uh, relates to uh, Greek communities elsewhere, both in the North American context, uh, and uh, I hope future research uh, will focus on a comparative study between Greek communities in Canada, uh, broadly North America, uh, perhaps South America, and Australia, not least in the particular issue of uh, commemoration of this uh, great event. I think it's one of those cases, uh, examples, if you like, that really can bring together uh, different communities, uh, different Greek uh, communities in this case, around the world. Nonetheless, uh, ceremonies, um, more broadly, as uh, Nikos Alexiou said uh, towards the end of his talk, they are important because this is how people attach, become attached to notions of identity such as uh, Greekness. And in the case of Canada and Toronto in particular, since the 1920s, newspaper articles uh, cover this, mainstream newspapers, uh, serve as entry points to this foreign, at the beginning, or at least uncommon culture that and aim to satisfy a public's a Toronto or Canadian more broadly public curiosity, especially in a rapidly changing uh, social environment such as the Canadian and specifically the Toronto one. Now, uh, since the sort of late 90s, uh, early 2000s, uh, there, there are studies on public events and ethnic identities in Toronto that reveal prevailing notions about immigrants and practices of citizenship. The Canadian Hispanic Day Parade, uh, it's a multicultural event that aim, aims at celebrating ethnic diversity, uh, represents the struggle of Latin American immigrants to advance their belonging in the city. And this is very much uh, how uh, in the last few decades, uh, the parade uh, of uh, Greeks on uh, Independence Day moved, uh, so to speak, to the Danforth. This is the Greek town area of Toronto in 1978. At a time when the press popularized and gradually fixed a by and large positive image about the Greekness uh, of the area, already a uh, dominant uh, image since the 1960s. 
in uh, the newspapers uh, uh, and the uh, photographs that uh, you will see, there is a, a sense uh, of um, a, any closed event in the first few years. Uh, this, is, this takes place in a theater, uh, complementing uh, the uh, event at uh, the Greek Community and Church uh, building at 170 Jarvis Street in downtown uh, Toronto. But it is in 1930 uh, that we have, uh, similarly to the United States and in Greece, uh, as Alexander Kitroev mentioned before, that we have in 1930 the celebration of uh, the 100th anniversary of liberation of country for Turks, from Turks, as the article called it. And this is uh, probably the only case in which technically the um, foundation of an independent state was celebrated and not the outbreak of the revolution that we commemorated uh, this year as well in its 200 year anniversary. But at that time, this is the first time that uh, Greeks are depicted, depicted in this collage of uh, photographs with young children, uh, one of them uh, of the Letros family. This is one of the sort of founding members uh, of the Greek uh, community. And it was uh, clearly stated that, you know, the, the boys and girls speak Greek as well as English uh, as sort of a pride and testament to their uh, Canadian-ness or their uh, Canadian Greek uh, identity. In um, the, uh, the year, a couple of years later, uh, and that is less than 10 years after uh, the Asia Minor uh, catastrophe, uh, we, we see already a pattern that will be continued in the period after uh, the Second World War, except from the parade. There is no parade yet, but, but there is a playlet uh, that is standardly uh, shown, uh, performed uh, in, uh, in a theater. Uh, and this is actually interested, uh, interesting because it took place at the Danforth uh, Theater way before the Danforth becomes uh, Greek town, this part of uh, Central East Toronto. So this is uh, another issue that um, is interesting here is how Greece is presented by Vice Consul uh, Martin, who is an appointed consul uh, for, for the Greek state, representing uh, the Greek state and Greeks in the city but it's not yet a, a consul that is uh, sent from, from Greece. This kind of uh, representation uh, will have to uh, wait until uh, after the Second World War. Uh, it is interesting how uh, Greece is uh, presented because it's a very much in a positive uh, image, a sort of you know, dominant uh, superior Balkan uh, country. Uh, this is actually at the cusp of uh, Greece uh, falling into bankruptcy for at least the second uh, time in its history. So I, I want our audience to uh, note a sort of very positive spin that uh, the, the vice consul uh, wants to project to those attending at the St. Greek, St. George's Greek Orthodox Church and uh, the event afterwards. Similarly, again, to the United States and perhaps elsewhere too, during World War II, the, uh, the image of Greeks and of Greece changed uh, significantly from uh, the uh, very, uh, tense, uh, to say the least, moment of the anti-Greek riots of 1918, in August of 1918, uh, Greeks in, in Toronto and Canada more broadly have moved a long way uh, towards uh, being seen as the best allies and very important allies of, uh, of Britain in the fight against uh, fascism and Nazism in Europe, and therefore allies of Canada. But it, what is also interesting is how, um, I mean, there's all sorts of historical inaccuracies in the ways in which the event was reported by Canadian newspapers in the interwar period. Uh, but this is a, a typical example of how, you know, misrepresented uh, images uh, can be about uh, the identity of uh, Greek women in this uh, particular photograph when it is uh, said that they are dressed in the ancient costumes of their native land. And we can discuss the, the debate, we can debate the definition of ancient in this case, but it's definitely not the ancient costume that one would associate uh, with uh, a classical uh, Greece. I should say that uh, in the 1940s, uh, the image changed uh, also as uh, the Second World War ended and civil war was raging in Greece. So the comments, by uh, the Greek uh, vice consul or consul sometimes uh, representing, uh, attending the event in, uh, in Canada was how uh, the, uh, the Greek army is fighting a communism similarly to how Greeks uh, fought the Turks in the 
in the 1820s. So the, the image of Greeks uh, also as those who suffered during World War II and generated um, large, um, uh, great sympathy for uh, among Canadians to support uh, through the anti uh, the Greek War Relief Fund. Uh, it continues with now uh, the identification of Greece and Greeks in Canada as sort of allies in the fight uh, of the Cold War during, against uh, communism. In the 1950s, uh, you have uh, the parade uh, probably uh, for the first time, uh, and the caption of this photograph uh, reads, image of women in traditional Greek costume. We've, moved, we've um, got a, uh, rid of the ancient, thankfully. Uh, marching Western Queen Street, holding a British flag. And uh, the, the costumes are um, uh, seen to be uh, representing women of uh, the Association of Antarctico uh, from Florida, one of the oldest, possibly the oldest association uh, of people uh, from a community of a village in Northwest Greece and some among uh, the first immigrants in, in the city. So what I want you to note here is that we now have uh, the uh, exit, so to speak, of the commemoration event uh, and the celebration from a closed space, the church and community building, or a theater to uh, the downtown area of, uh, of the city. Similarly, this uh, culminated to the uh, presenting a memorial wreath at the Cenotaph outside the Tondos uh, City Hall, uh, where uh, there is now representation of Greek uh, men as well as women in uh, the traditional, so to speak, uh, costumes. Uh, note the presence of children uh, as well. They're very uh, important in other representations, as is the, the play um, genre uh, that is uh, sort of a standard in uh, among the repertoire of events for this uh, celebration. This is, again, I don't think there's anything atypical about this. I think it takes place uh, in many uh, parts of the world and probably still does and will still do. Uh, we'll see, uh, but it is a standard representation of reenactment of, uh, you know, the, the Zalago dance or sort of uh, key moments of what is considered key moments of the Greek Revolution. Uh, note here the um, the language in which uh, newspapers such as the Toronto Telegram present that this is more than 1,500 persons of Greek extraction. Uh, uh, with Marcos Economides, the Greek consul. Now there is a Greek official representative uh, in in uh, the city. I should note here that uh, a comment about the parades uh, most, more broadly, that in the 1950s, Toronto has moved quite a long way or is moving uh, quite uh, fast away from Toronto in the 1930s, still as one historian has called it, the Belfast of Canada, uh, where you know large numbers of uh, Irish uh, population were, uh, if not uh, dominating and still present, uh, we, and their parades were very uh, visible uh, and they're very local in, in the city. So there is, of course, the uh, very traditional um, uh, Protestant Orange Order parades, uh, the Catholic religious processions. These uh, were some of the first of the major public events. Uh, while in the, in the 1930s and possibly in the 1940s and 50s, new ethnic immigrant nationalisms, such as Hungarian, uh, Italian, and still in their early stages, Greek, uh, were emerging very slowly. So I think there's a pattern that they follow here uh, with the religious and ethnic overtones um, uh, ingrained in, in both. The um, uh, image of uh, children, four-year-old Joan uh, Zoitis, as is mentioned here, uh, dressed as a, uh, as a as an Atsoliasos, as an Evzons, uh, all obviously, uh, is um, also a, a pattern that, you know, now uh, you have uh, something that continues to the present. You have Mayor uh, Nathan Phillips that speaks in their event. So that it, this commemoration event becomes uh, much more in the mainstream as uh, the number of Greeks in the city and in Canada as a whole increased. I would just like to remind you that between the late 50s and early 70s, more than 100,000 Greeks moved uh, to, uh, to Canada uh, from Greece primarily, uh, and most of them uh, permanently. By the 1960s, however, another interesting development begins to take shape. And this is, again, has to do with how Greeks and Greek town, now Danforth, is perceived. And I might, might remind you again that this is still uh, at the time before the parade moves to the Greek town. So um, as is uh, common in several newspapers, mainstream, such as the Globe and Mail, 
In this case, uh, Greek Independence Day becomes something to do uh, during something to do and see during the weekend among theater and the list of the newspaper article goes on for the down dance, artistic exhibitions, displays, um, um, and other you know uh, uh, theater as, as seen here, sports and other events. So this is uh, something of a pattern that will uh, develop later on uh, in the future decades as well. Um, from very early on, as in the 1950s, uh, photo of uh, women from the Association of Antarctica Florida, the uh, presence of associations that represent a community and uh, re respectively a community that is um, uh, complemented by associations is very visible in the Independence Day parade as well. And still, uh, as I believe in the last time a parade uh, happened in Toronto and elsewhere, probably community is represented by associations as well. They're very prominent uh, in this uh, event. Here, the Society of Castorians is called Omonia, not Omondia, as was uh, misspelled. And uh, the caption reads that his feet and his Greek kilt are all that show. Note, note the kilt uh, uh, language here uh, is a show of a five-year-old uh, who stands behind towering flanks and banners. And um, this is, uh, again, something that uh, continues in all the way to the present. You have these images, uh, of course, uh, but uh, what begins to be more prominent is emphasis on uh, Greek Canadians, the next generation of children who are something that you, were, you, sh you also sh saw in the 1930 uh, photograph, but now it's very central. Uh, and um, similarly to what uh, Nick, uh, Nikos Alexiou mentioned earlier about New York in the 1967-74 period, the Greek Independence Day becomes very contested. So you have not only news on the day when the parade and commemoration is reported about Canadians uh, getting involved in anti-dictatorship struggle, you also have events in the Greek community in Toronto and Montreal where uh, the event of comm the commemoration itself was disrupted, sometimes with fights breaking out uh, between anti-dictatorship, very uh, you know, vocal activists and the sort of establishment, so to speak, of uh, uh, religious leaders, the community uh, leaders who try to take a sort of neutral stance, but at this time, everyone identifies uh, not saying anything against the dictatorship with a pro-dictatorship uh, stance, at least anti-dictatorship groups certainly did. Um, I should note here that uh, it came to my mind as Alexander Kitroev was speaking that the, um, uh, there is a now revival of the AHEPA um, uh, commemoration of the AHEPA uh, leadership commemorating the event with visiting uh, dignitaries of the Greek state, including at the highest level, the president. And that is something that happens quite a lot during the dictatorship period uh, from Canada as well as the United States with the Pan-Macedonian, the Pan-Macedonian um, uh, association that is uh, prominent, not just during the uh, commemoration event, but especially when they have their annual conference, I believe twice during the dictatorship and they visit um, uh, dictator Papadopoulos uh, as well. But uh, this is one of the cases where uh, the event of the commemoration uh, cut across or intersected um, with uh, the involvement of Canadians in what was happening in Greece and uh, in uh, among Greeks in Canada uh, too. Following the uh, fall of the dictatorship and the rise of uh, Pasok and Andreas Papandreou in uh, power in Greece, uh, Greek politics and Canadian Greek communities sometimes intersect on the day of the parade as well. So in 1983, for example, uh, uh, the um, commemoration coincided with the visit of uh, Papandreou in, in Greece for the first time uh, after he left uh, the city in 1974, where he was uh, in Toronto for five, for about five years between 69 and 74. This, of course, um, represents an one more case of the numerous ones in which the so-called homeland politics of Greeks in Canada uh, intersect uh, and sort of shape their identities and their um, a role in the city and their visibility in the city. I sort of tend to be a little bit more critical of the term homeland politics because it is as much about the ways in which uh, Greeks in Canada or elsewhere to perceive uh, the politics in Greece, but also has to do with how they think they believe are perceived by uh, Canadians uh, here. 
the 1980s represents probably the peak uh, of the parade in terms of the number of people who participated. You know, we have in the uh, 1980s uh, estimates of 50,000, 60, even 70,000 in one case of Greeks participating, which is an enormous number you know, for a city uh, and it's, it's Greek population, of course. So that doesn't mean that this is only Greeks from the city, they may be from elsewhere. And by 84, uh, suburbanization has already taken place. And, uh, but the Greek town at the same time becomes, so to speak, the uh, identifiable and in, in practice, the sort of uh, uh, meeting point of many Greeks in, uh, in Toronto and the greater Toronto area, but also it becomes uh, more identified uh, with, the, uh, with the parade. Uh, and the parade moved to the Danforth area, the Greek town in 1978. Um, this, however, was uh, checked some years uh, by the fierce weather that could be uh, punishing, and so it could bring, uh, depending on the uh, on the day, of course, participation down to two or three thousand. So it could really um, uh, range uh, quite; uh, it could vary quite significantly. Um, you also have the images, you know, that I, I don't think we would, we are used to anymore for. Um, uh, political correctness and practical reasons. I don't think anyone would like to see a boy uh, with even a toy gun uh, uh, today. And uh, the image, of course, with many Greeks, you know, sort of crammed over there in front at the PASOK offices, uh, organ local uh, office in Toronto, uh, which is now long gone, uh, is also a testament to how, you know, popular in 93 uh, political organizations such as PASOK uh, were in, in the city, legacy, of course, of the uh, of the PAC movement of the uh, dictatorship uh, years and the presence of Andreas Papandreou. In, um, uh, in another case, and I'm uh, uh, completing the presentation in two minutes, uh, in another case of homeland politics, uh, the uh, event of, of the events of 1991-94 uh, with the collapse of Yugoslavia and uh, the rising tensions among uh, Canadian Macedonians and Greek uh, communities in the city uh, reverberated also during the um, uh, parade on Independence Day. You have in the same article, uh, I think uh, a, in the same page, uh, three different articles that represent how the event uh, and the case, the issue, the so-called Macedonian uh, issue was uh, perceived, how by Greeks and Macedonians respectively, and how some newspapers, such as the Toronto Star, were particularly uh, at the center of the disputes, uh, to the extent that uh, protesters uh, really attacked the newspaper, um, chanting no more lies, uh, uh, claiming that the uh, newspaper was supporting uh, the claims of Macedonians for um, sort of, you know, a thousand years uh, history and the claim to uh, effectively a Greek uh, territory. So the, this event was not, um, was marked by, the, the commemoration was marked by the sort of tensions around the so-called uh, Macedonian issue. This uh, came up in 93, 94. It has subsided, uh, of course, uh, ever since. But then now in the 2000s, so to speak, onwards, not really now, but in the last 20 years, what is uh, happening, I think, and from that's again from the commemoration uh, reporting, is that uh, the case, has, the event has become much more of a street party, uh, much more celebrating uh, Greekness and the sacrifice, so to speak, of the immigrants uh, who came in the 50s and 60s. So that's it's a lot more about that, not unlike uh, other street parades and events of other communities in the city. And uh, in, uh, in uh, another example of how the, um, the event has become sort of folklore was the for years uh, presence of uh, someone dressed as uh, Kolokotronis reenacting, including uh, riding a horse uh, at the parade. Uh, and uh, this is uh, again in the, in the articles, uh, much more about celebrating the achievements and uh, efforts of Greek immigrants rather than about the event itself. Uh, and and um, as uh, in the 2000s and as um, seen earlier since the 1960s, the event has become celebrated as a sort of mainstream uh, with uh, uh, mainstream uh, Canadian politicians, not just local or uh, city politicians, but regional as well as uh, federal, national level. And of course, this now takes place uh, in a multicultural uh, Canada that is also significantly changed since the 1950s and 60s. 
To conclude, uh, the uh, um, uh, 200 years on uh, anniversary uh, found us at the middle of a pandemic uh, and uh, at the cusp of a digital uh, age. And uh, it was interesting to, uh, to me and I think quite a lot of uh, other people, quite a few other people that uh, this time at the event, uh, there was no parade, uh, there was no gala performance of the Greek community or anybody else. There was a podcast uh, that I think uh, is important to, to highlight here. And uh, I'm biased, of course, I was uh, part of the making of it, but I think it's trying to take a distance from it. It's a very interesting way of approaching an event um, in a you know, fairly sophisticated, but not compl uh, complex way. Uh, and at the same time, reaching a much wider audience, not as wide, uh, unfortunately, as a parade of 70,000 people, but still something that uh, has the uh, potential to reach a global potentially audience, uh, not, uh, not just uh, local. And the initial starting point uh, was, of course, you know, this is not the history you learned at Greek school, but of course it goes way beyond uh, standard uh, stereotypes of how the revolution, um, uh, what they what, of the history of the revolution, and I think it tells uh, a story about how uh, the idea itself and the commemoration event is perceived by Greeks in this case of Canada. It's also important to note that the event was under the auspices of the 2021 committee in Greece, with its uh, with its mandate to reach audiences uh, beyond uh, Greece. And to conclude, uh, from a closed event uh, that was reported in a sort of as a curiosity in several ways where it was mixed with um, notes about how, you know, the candles uh, and the in the church uh, uh, were lit and how people participate in, and sang in their own language, uh, the event became much more mainstream in downtown Toronto in the 1950s to the parade in the Greek town since 1978. Uh, the Greek community gala performance and the flag raising ceremony continue at the Ontario Parliament this time, so sort of elevated in a, in a sense, and not as previously commemorated at the City Hall. Um, it seems to me, and that's something that I need to work on uh, much more, that ethnic pride has been portrayed differently by various organizations, HEPA Canada, since the 1920s in some cities. Uh, the Greek community, the church, and Greek consular authorities, so they have, and you know, the broader uh, people who participate. Uh, to sum up, at the times of crisis, such as in the 1940s and during the dictatorship, Independence Day became a contested uh, terrain. In the 19, early 1990s, the so-called Macedonian issue dominated the commemoration of Independence uh, Day. In the 21st century, commemoration is both about uh, the struggles and achievements of Greeks in Canada, as much as it is about the glory of the revolution and the creation of an independent uh, country. On the 200 year uh, anniversary, the impact of pandemic and the digital age is seen in the production of new media and ways to commemorate to a global as well as a local audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saki. Thank you for uh, taking us to the beautiful cities in Canada uh, and maybe cold, colder than where we are. And it's interesting to compare uh, the, the resonance of the revolution in uh, US cities as, with the Canadian uh, cities as well. And this entanglement of uh, politics and identity formation, etc. Uh, so as you can tell, academics do not keep schedules, right? We are <laughs> late. However, we're gonna take some questions and uh, I will read one question for Alexander. Alexander, are you here? Yes. Um, so I, we have a question in the Q&A from Professor David Charles, who is Professor of Philosophy and Classics here at Yale University. And I read his question. To what extent were the American Philhellenes of 1821, like Gridley Howe and George Jarvis, influenced by and their work dependent on the London Philhellenes, such as Byron, Boring, Bentham, and Blaquer? I guess this is for you, Alexander. So American and uh, British Philhellenism. Yes, uh, the answer is to a great extent. It's somewhat of a paradox because You've had uh, the, um, the, the War of 1812 uh, between America and Britain. Nonetheless, Byron is uh, hugely important. Romanticism is very important and significant in America at the time, as you know. 
uh, and uh, particularly Byron is uh, seen as uh, a very important figure. Uh, and his death in 1824 is all over the newspapers. And a great deal of the poetry of the time, which um, harps on philhellenic issues and topics, is very much influenced uh, by uh, Byron. That Byron is the main influence of all the uh, persons you spoke about. Bentham as well is also. So there is a there is a a, a, a um, connection between the British. Philhellenic movement and the American one. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Yorgo and Agnosto, I see you have your hand raised. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is a question for uh, Alexander Kitraev. Uh, Alexander, thank you for the presentation. Uh, we, we all know that uh, in commemorations, remembering is selective, which means remembering also connects with forgetting. And uh, in, indeed, if we see the evolution of Achiappa on how particularly it constructs the remembering of Phil, American Philhellenism, we have a very positive um, narrative about this, uh, the practitioners of this uh, movement. Um, and in many ways, uh, uh, they very much consistent with what you called the instrumentalization of the event to, in many ways, produce a mutuality between Greece and the United States. The American Philhellenes are lovers of uh, liberty, as are the Greek revolutionaries. And also, there is also connection with the American Philhellenic um, uh, engagement with the abolitionist movement, which in many ways also underlines their um, love of liberty in the United States. My, my question is, if you care to share with us some thoughts of what is it that we are missing? What is it that is compromised? What is it that we are forgetting? But by this selective narrative of American Philhellenism, and the follow-up question will be: uh, In what way this forgetting connects with the construction, with the making of Greek American identity, on how it understands itself in relation to American history? in relation to other ethnic, ethnic and racial groups in the United States. Nice, <laughs> comprehensive, Yorgo, as usual. Um, first of all, what we remember, to start with that, uh, to, to reiterate it, is the appeal that the uh, American Philhellenes have in the sense that they are unproblematically uh, lovers and admirers of Greece and connect with Greece based on uh, American values. You know, the American Philhellenes see very much uh, 1821 as a reflection of 1776 uh, in Europe. So that's, that's what the, the focus of the celebration of the American Philhellenes is. Um, the forgetting is on several levels. First of all, there's a forgetting of the history itself. As we know, me memory is different from history. The history of Philhellenism is much more complex. It's got, you know, a number of Philhellenes go to Greece and return uh, because they are disappointed by what they see, but th by the internal fighting uh, that's taking place, by the conditions that they encounter. Samuel Gridley Howe himself has written a book which is available on the web, published in 1828, a short history of the Greek Revolution, in which uh, he is very open about the civil wars and uh, the deficiencies of the Greeks. That I think that's what makes Gridley Howe quite special, but no one seems to... Gridley Howe is celebrated but by people that maybe haven't read uh, through his book, as may not be uh, surprising. So those uh, are, are a couple of ways that I think is the, the, the there is uh, this instrumentalization. Uh, America, um, American Philhellenism and Philhellenism in general is sanitized and used 
uh, for those purposes. There are many uh, second, third, fourth generation Americans, and I've, they've spoken to me as I've been doing oral research with the HEPA, and they've described them, they've said, I'm a, uh, you know, I'm not really Greek anymore, I'm a Philhellene. Uh, they mean it in not necessarily the academic way we describe the term Philhellenism, but it's quite similar. Uh, the last part was with uh, other ethnic groups, could you just Right. The, the question was that uh, there is a particular forgetting. And in, we know that memory, uh, selective memory, is in many ways constitutes uh, ethnic identity. So uh, the, um, the Ahepa remembering constitutes uh, the understanding of Greek Americans and Greek American identity in relation to American history. Uh, what does the forgetting in many ways, uh, how does the forgetting shape this identity in a particular way in connection to how Greek Americans understand the history of ethnic and racial hierarchies in the United States? Um, I'll have to think about that one. Uh, that's a, a, comp a complex, uh, but obviously it relates to the fact that the, um, the Greek Americans see the um, the way that the the way that the American Philhellenes see the Greeks is they see them very similar. There is an issue of whiteness. I don't know if that's where we're going. The interesting thing with 1821 onwards is that the uh, the Greeks are seen as white and the Ottomans are seen from the Orientalist lens as uh, as others as barbaric, uncivilized, etc. It's, it's, there's a, it's a very interesting that the slaughter that takes place during the, recap, the capture of Tripolis by the Greeks is almost ignored by the European press and then, and then the massacres of the Ottomans are, are, are highly uh, are amplified because of course it confirms uh, the stereotype of uh, barbarian slaughtering whites. So the whiteness that the uh, Philhellenes uh, imbue the, the 1821 Greeks with is, is a positive reflection, of course, on the Greek Americans. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have several nice questions at the, under the Q&A. I will take one for Sakis uh, by Professor Tom Galland. Saki, it seems that the image of the Greek community was rehabilitated quite soon after the riots. How do you account for that? Um, Thank you, Tom uh, and Maria for, for reading the question. Uh, the process is, um, I would say, uh, fairly quick, uh, but careful. Uh, but cautious from the point of view of the Greek community. As uh, Tom Gallant uh, knows and has written about it, uh, there is a campaign to, uh, with papers, uh, with newspaper articles from the Greek community uh, to reinstate the image. But again, as uh, Tom noted in his uh, book and the documentary on, on the anti-Greek riots, uh, there is, uh, you know, other events uh, took over. You know, the 1918 pandemic, the, uh, the end of the uh, World War I. Um, I think what uh, also happened is happening here is that uh, Greece begins to receive a most, not positive, but more sympathetic image uh, in Canada because of the um, uh, Asia Minor uh, and uh, catastrophe and uh, the uh, end of the Greek presence in Asia Minor. Uh, the uh, fairly well known, and I think will be noted more quickly, more uh, prominently next year, uh, the campaign of uh, people for humanitarian reasons towards Greeks from Asia Minor, the Greek Orthodox uh, people from Asia Minor, also uh, affected uh, Canadians and uh, some institutions uh, here and possibly Canadian policy. So within this context, uh, the presence of Greeks in uh, commemorating and being reported for the first time, a sort of you know curiosity, but from a positive point of view, is seems to be the case, and that happens in 1925, 1930, and onwards. Yeah, 
Thank you. Here, I would like to read a comment by Marcia Economopoulos. Uh, um, she writes, talking about inclusion and omission in historical narratives and celebrations. So there is no mention of Greek Jews and their Philhellenism. As we know, Marcia is the director of the Jewish Center, Greek Jewish Center in New York. So there is no mention of Greek uh, Jews and Philhellenism. And the last question for this panel is for all of uh, you, I guess, and Nick uh, is also for you, Nick for New York. So a question from uh, Stefan, Professor Stefanos Katsikas. So he asks uh, Stefanos, the parades are organized by groups and are sponsored by the community and beyond. Can you maybe reflect, uh, say a few words on the way, the profile of sponsors and how this has been evolved? When did the Greek and Cypriot states started to get involved in the organization and sponsorship of these events and why? These are big questions as he mentions, but maybe we can get an idea. Okay, could you a little bit elaborate maybe about this role of sponsors to these parades? Nick, are you here? And Saki yes. and yes, Alexander? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, basically, it is the sponsors that make it possible. Uh, for New York, uh, as um, I mentioned uh, into the presentation, since we don't see you, we don't see your own face, just so you know. <laughs> okay. Oh, here you are. Yes. <laughs> uh, as, I, as I mentioned um, in the presentation, uh, since 1938, after the establishment of uh, the Federation, uh, they are responsible. So it is a whole process. They start uh, minimum six months earlier, uh, you know, and it's basically the sponsors, uh, people from the, the community. Uh, and of course, uh, in the second role, uh, the associations. So uh, it is a process of uh, uh, having an application and also um, a lefkoma uh, that uh, is, is produced and the sponsors donate money. So it is, it is a long process. Uh, uh, regarding collecting the money. As I said, uh, since the Greek American community has this uh, upward socioeconomic mobility, uh, every year becomes more expensive uh, because it involves, uh, it involves uh, um, the, uh, the New York uh, uh, city, mayors, uh, police, other things, uh, renting uh, uh, the place, uh, uh, the dinner. So there's a lot of money involved. And uh, the, the committee, uh, the Federation elects a committee specifically for the parade, and um, they do whatever they can <laughs> in order to uh, uh, achieve the goal. Um, also, think... also because uh, uh, of the crisis in, in, the, in the Federation uh, the, couple, the past few years, uh, there is a, a debate if the Parade will continue uh, with them, or other other associations will get, get involved. Um, so it is a serious issue at this moment for the Greek American community, who is going to uh, sponsor the parade. Yeah, I guess. I guess you're right, yes, and I just would like to only uh, read the, a question by Gerasimus Katsan. Professor Katsan asks, how would a parade that create dial creates dialogue and presents alternatives to the mainstream narrative look, how this parade would look like, yeah, an alternative um, parade? So maybe, yeah, we can think of that. And... Can I... Yes, I have please. one comment. I, I actually think that the, the parade is already an alternative to the typical parade that we have in Greece, because it's, the, the parade in Greece is a, is a military par parade. And the parade in, I've, I've watched both the New York parades and the Philadelphia ones. The New York ones can become very uh, patriotic and overflow into nationalistic. Uh, uh, depending on the situation of Greek-Turkish relations at the time. But the parade with floats is, is an American thing. The Greek parade on Fifth Avenue is an American event and can turn into a more of a fun thing. In Philadelphia, where the stakes are lower politically, you've got the basketball team of St. Demetrius, uh, uh, have its own float, etc. And there's more of a fun element. 
Um, the parade in New York is more political. The parades in other places are already alternatives and create, open the possibility to give a different tone to uh, March 25th, not kind of heroes and sacrifice, but celebration. Yeah. Yeah, Maria, can I make a brief comment about how, uh, in the case of Toronto, something yeah. interesting happened in the early 2000s. The, uh, the parade takes, takes place, of course, around the end of March, uh, which can be very cold. So uh, at the time when some years the event was also all becoming a, like a street party as well as a parade, uh, the uh, Business Improvement Association of uh, the Danforth, the Greek town, came up with the idea to have a taste on the Danforth event on the second weekend of August, in which you know up to a million people go, and that is the real street and food party. So the parade, as a result, has maintained this kind of more conventional uh, character of you know educational groups, associations, and whoever else wants to parade, uh, to participate in the parade, takes place. Uh, so as I said, it's also very cold, so you can't really have a street party on most years in the end of uh, March. But that is how sort of the two events have sort of distinguished. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know if you, Nick, would like to add to that for the parade in New York, an alternative uh, how it would look like, if not? Uh, well, uh, it has to, uh, other things has to happen first in order to uh, uh, unleash or liberate the marginalized groups. First of all, uh, it has to be a restructure to the Greek American uh, uh, curriculum uh, of schools. Uh, if you have uh, at this moment uh, university students uh, who still uh, hold on onto the theories or, or the, uh, the, uh, the folklore of uh, Krifos Holyo instead of uh, doing uh, 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 historical sociological analysis uh, of the event, we'll, we'll never have an alternative. So it has to be uh, a, a whole uh, different uh, approach uh, to the uh, to the commemoration, to, to the history uh, of, uh, of th this debate that you already uh, mentioned, uh, what is omitted and what, what is, uh, what is uh, 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 remembered is very important. And it has to, it has to do uh, with uh, the production and the reproduction of the established uh, ideologies. And, and uh, as, as you saw, that's why I saw this picture uh, throughout uh, the 50 years period from uh, the 50s and uh, the, two, uh, the 2021 uh, of, of uh, the, the dominant ideologies. It has to be, it has to be uh, a whole process of uh, redesigning uh, the curriculum of Greek American uh, schools uh, and, and be more uh, yeah. his historically uh, correct. This will take time, I guess, but that's why we are here to work on that and to, to do our research and collaborate. Yeah, also, in, 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 in my previous uh, event I, I organized, uh, I brought uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the story of, uh, of uh, 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 James Williams, who was an African-American, who, who was liberated uh, from Baltimore and he fought uh, in Greece and he died in Greece. And he's buried in Argos. So uh, we have new uh, historical uh, evidence that should be included uh, in the role of uh, African Americans uh, uh, regarding the revolution. So uh, we have uh, developments, but it, it has to be uh, in a more uh, larger scale. Right.